my father was just bowled over by this handsome, elegant, eloquent, courageous young man. Uh, and, and, and he cherished the memory of having seen him, if only for a few minutes. Uh, but as soon as he had the Schutz Pass, I was brought to the embassy, and the three of us were taken to one of the safe houses. Uh, we were given one room on the third floor, but we didn't stay in that room very long because uh, a couple of nights later, the Russians bombed the building. Uh, Russian bombs fell on the building, and of course, when the when the bombing begins, the sirens go on and so on. We went down to the uh, to the cellar. Uh, these were well-built houses, so the cellar was was a protection. Uh, when the bombing was over and we tried to go upstairs, we realized there was no upstairs to go back to. So we stayed in in the cellar. There were 128 of us, and. Food was very scarce. Food was ta brought in literally by Wallenberg. He would come during the night, and he would bring food. And if, the ch if any child was up, he would play with the child. He would never really identify himself. Um, everybody knew his leather coat, and that's how you, know, so you saw the leather coat. You knew that that's, that's who it was. But morale was so high. I mean, the, the real comfort in, in, the, in the cellar was no greater. Of course, we had no bed bugs, but uh, the actual comfort was no greater than in prison. But my God, what a difference. First of all, we were, we were considered worthy of saving. And that is just an incredible feeling. I mean, if I may digress for a moment, I had a very good friend who's also a Wallenberg survivor, <clears throat> was a librarian in the CUNY system in New York, who was 21 at the time I was 15. And she was on a death march. That was when the Germans no longer had uninterrupted tracks to take people to Auschwitz. They marched them on foot. And uh, she was on this march with her mother and her aunt. And at night, they were herded into uh, one of these large, brick factories, uh, there was blackouts, so they didn't see where they were walking. Some of them fell into the pits, and they didn't have to worry about anything. But the ones who found a little piece of ground to lie down on for the night were just so dehumanized that there was total silence. Nobody said a word. And in the morning when they opened their eyes, they saw this they thought they, they saw a mirage. They were, they were hallucinated. This handsome young man bustling about among them and saying, don't worry, I'll come back for you. Well, an hour and a half or so later, when the gates opened and a fleet of trucks pulled in, and here was the same young man calling off hundreds of names and saying, hurry up, get up on this truck. I, you remember, I gave you these papers at the embassy. Of course, you, you forgot them on your way to oblivion, but get up, get, get on the truck. She said, the 500 people, there were 500 men, women, and children. As if one, they all exclaimed, Shema Yisrael. Hear, O Israel. And she said, not because their lives were saved, Though, I mean, that was a big thing. But because they felt somebody considered them worthy of saving. So that, you know, that was Wallenberg.